Before I begin, let's take a look at a minute-long clip of Kent Hovind, the young Kent Hovind. The second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, fall apart, or break down. Nothing gets better by itself. That's what the Bible teaches. The heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. Nothing gets better by itself. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Everything tends toward chaos, right? Here is Sue at 20. Here she is at 90. <laughs> and here she is at 3,000. Everything tends toward chaos, folks, all right? All you have to do is nothing, and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out. That's what the second law is all about. Everything is getting worse. Nothing's getting better. But the textbook says, humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. So originally I wasn't planning on making this video, but I feel like this is something that really needs to be out there so creationists can understand this simple law of thermodynamics. This video is a follow-up from my previous video on Richard Kent, so if you haven't seen that yet, the link will be in the description. So let's get right into it. What is the second law of thermodynamics? In short, it says that an isolated system will tend towards higher entropy. Creationists love to twist the meaning of this law in order to promote their own propaganda. It's really fucked up. If you ask them what are the other laws of thermodynamics, they won't know shit. And the reason is usually that these young earth nutjobs read off some sort of creationist site, such as Answers from Genesis. And from there, they read and absorb anything that supports their worldview. And one thing that you find on creationist sites is the second law of thermodynamics. But what about the other laws? They simply don't give a fuck, except for maybe the first one. But other than those two, the other laws don't interest them one bit, and that really says something. These people are ignorant about science. They don't care what science entails and the massive amount of work dedicated to developing an idea, except when a field of science that supposedly supports their position comes along, they jump right into it. If that isn't cherry picking, I don't know what is. So now that that's out of the way, let's get to the meat of the topic. This is how their argument goes. First, they substitute the word entropy with disorder, and then they say that disorder increases over time. Therefore, this disproves evolution, since the increased complexity of organisms claimed by evolution is somehow considered to be more ordered than disordered. The first thing I would like to point out is the irony on how you're using science to disprove science. That is hilarious. You creationists are so funny. But now, let's take a good look at this disorder word. My biggest problem is that you use this word so randomly and without meaning. What is disorder? How can you measure disorder? We can't, it's so ambiguous. Please, stick to the word entropy. Entropy has proper units, joules over kelvin. We can calculate the amount of entropy in a system and this increase in entropy over time. So, let's see what this law really says. Imagine you have two batteries that store energy. Now, it doesn't have to be batteries, it can be any medium of energy storage. The second law of thermodynamics states that whenever you transfer energy from one system to the next, you won't have 100% efficiency. So when you're using battery A to charge battery B, you can't have full efficiency. Where does the leftover energy go? It is released as heat into the environment. That's why when you charge your phone on an outlet, your phone will heat up because energy is being lost. Heat is very difficult to utilize, and when a system is at equilibrium, you cannot convert this uniformity of heat into useful energy. So in an isolated system where you have energy being transferred around, you're going to keep losing energy as heat. And this is the increase in entropy. When energy can be properly stored in mediums, the entropy is low. When less and less energy is stored and more is released as useless heat, entropy is high. This is what we mean by increasing in entropy in isolated systems. If you leave a system by itself without any intervention, it will bound to increase in entropy due to this lack of energy transfer efficiency. So what does this have to do with the Earth? Let's revisit the creationists' argument. Animals evolve to more complex structures, but this is against the second law of thermodynamics since that is supposedly getting more ordered. Well, no. The law states the efficiency of energy transfer from one medium to the next and how it cannot be 100% efficient. It really has nothing to do with something being more ordered or not. But let's take a closer look. Living organisms on Earth are actually mediums of energy storage. They store energy, and they're awfully good at it. So where does this energy come from? That's right, it comes from the sun. The only way this would violate the second law of thermodynamics is if the energy living organisms obtain from the sun is somehow greater than or equal to the energy the sun gives to us. 
Is that the case? Hell no. In fact, we see perfectly how living organisms on Earth follow the second law of thermodynamics. This is represented by an ecological pyramid. On the bottom of the pyramid, we have primary producers and primary consumers. Then towards the top, we have secondary and tertiary consumers. Now, you guys probably all know what this means. The producers are any organisms that can harvest energy from the sun, usually by photosynthesis. Primary consumers are organisms that consume these primary producers, such as deer or cows. Then, secondary consumers eat the primary consumers and so forth. You get the idea. This pyramid illustrates two things. First, it represents the general number of organisms that exist in each of these fields. So, of course, there are more plants than deer, and there are more deer than tigers. This is due to one crucial reason which is related to the second thing that this pyramid represents, energy. The amount of energy circulating the systems lower in the pyramid is greater than the higher ones, and because there is less energy higher up, there are fewer organisms that can exist on the top of the pyramid. This energy difference is due to two reasons. First, there is energy expenditure while the organism is alive. Of course, the energy utilized by the organism itself cannot be transferred over. Second, the energy transfer efficiency, as predicted by the second law of thermodynamics, cannot be 100% effective. I'm not saying that this proves the second law, I'm just saying that it doesn't violate it. If we saw that secondary and tertiary consumers had greater or equal energy totals compared to primary producers, then yes, it would be a violation of the law. However, that's not the case. This is how the second law of thermodynamics is applied to organisms on Earth. It's short term, not long term so that it affects evolution. Think of it this way. Let's go back to the battery example I proposed earlier. We charge the first battery from an ultimate energy source, then pass the energy through each successive battery. These batteries are analogous to organisms on Earth. The first organism takes energy from the ultimate energy source, the sun, then transfers the energy to the next organism after it is eaten. It's the same as having the energy transfer through batteries. The second law of thermodynamics states that when you transfer energy from one battery or organism to the next, you cannot have 100% efficiency. That's exactly what we observe. Now, get this, the law doesn't say anything on how these batteries can evolve. The battery can evolve to whatever complex structure it wants to, and it wouldn't violate the second law as long as some of the energy is lost during energy transfer. Similarly, the organisms can evolve as much as they want, and change to whatever structure they want, and it wouldn't violate the law. It's as simple as that. The fact that creationists propose this as an argument against evolution is baffling, because they are simply showing that they do not understand thermodynamics. But to be honest, it's not just religious people who don't understand this. Some atheists try to argue against their flawed argument by claiming the Earth isn't an isolated system. True, the Earth isn't an isolated system, but that is very, very misleading. By using that as a counter-argument, you are basically saying, oh, you're right about everything, except for the type of system the Earth is. And that's completely wrong, because they're not right, not even one bit. Their argument stems from their ability to even comprehend the laws of thermodynamics. And when the first thing you say to them is, the Earth is not isolated, you're giving them the wrong idea, which ends up with bullshit like this. Evolutionists will say, well, Hovind, don't you know, if you add energy, you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics. And the Earth receives energy from the sun, so the Earth is an open system, and that's how we overcome the law. I understand the argument, but they're missing the point. The universe is a closed system, number one. Number two, adding energy is destructive unless there's a special mechanism to use and harness the energy. See, the Japanese added a bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor one day. They didn't organize a thing for us, did they? So a few years later, we added some energy to a few of their cities, didn't we? You know, returned the favor. Didn't organize anything for them. Adding energy is destructive. The sun adds energy to the roof of your house, but it's going to destroy your house. The sun's energy will destroy the entire house. The sun's energy will destroy the roof on your car. It will destroy your upholstery. The sun's energy will destroy your paint job. <laughs> There's only one thing that can actually use the sun's energy. Chlorophyll. And one little plant cell is more complex than a space shuttle. That's the kind of shit you get. It's amazing. Mentioning the sun, my atheist friends, is not the proper way to refute their argument. Because their argument is fundamentally messed up from the core. They can't even grasp the basic of one of the most important laws in the universe. Ugh. Okay, sorry for the frustration. Before I end this video, I bet you guys want to know what the other laws are, because they are quite amazing as well. The zeroth law states that if one system is in thermal equilibrium with a second system, and the second system is in equilibrium with a third system, then the first and third systems are in equilibrium. Simple enough? The first law states that if there is energy movement in or out of a system, the system's internal energy changes to comprehend. This is a more complicated way of saying energy and matter cannot be created nor destroyed. 
The third law states that as a substance arrives at absolute zero, its entropy will also approach zero. I bet creationists didn't know all these laws. Anyway, I hope I clear things up, and I hope y'all learned something today. If you did, leave a comment. I take feedback of any kind. See ya.